Okay, so let's get started. And I'm gonna, like I said, do this sort of more webinar style because most of the viewers are gonna be watching this later tonight or tomorrow. Uh, so it'll end up sort of being more like a video. But if you do have any questions, type them into the chat. I'll unmute you um, and feel welcome to ask any question because I do want that to be a part of this. So if you, um, I'm not sure if either of you had signed up for the last workshop, but um, I did a book walkthrough already and I started from the beginning. So what I thought I would do today is start from the end or somewhat like the end and go backwards. So I'm gonna share my screen and tell you, well, maybe before I do that, I'll talk about the book a little bit, but Box Shapes 2 is the sequel to this guy, which I put out on May 25th in 2017 after working on it for a few years. So now it's 2021. Uh, last year I had a lot more time, obviously, so I got to put together all the notes I had had left over from this book and then going forward and put together Box Shapes 2. Now this book is about, uh, I think, 68 pages long. The next book is going to be double that. So it's gonna be a big book. It's probably about four books worth of material. Um, but I just couldn't, I kept trying to break it up in different ways and I couldn't find a way that I was happy with. So I kept it as one big book. So that's what you get. I think you get a lot for the money uh, with the new book because it's very full. And uh, I believe it was Art that maybe asked me recently about the Bass Clef version, which since I had some time today, I was working on the Bass Clef version of the new book. And you know, it's going a little faster than I thought it was going to go. Maybe I'm getting better at doing this kind of stuff but um i think it'll be ready in a month or so so i'm really looking forward to getting the bass clef version out uh, as bass players have possibly been more into this book <laughs> than saxophone players which is great um so anyway this was book one last month i put out the etudes book uh, which are now insider secret um the box this is a demo version but the etudes books are all up on amazon in print now so if anybody bought the uh, PDF of the Etudes books, uh, the ebook, uh, they're now in print and they look great in print. They're not that long, you know, they stay open on your stand really nicely versus the larger books. Uh, so this is a sample of the base edition of the Etudes book. Uh, and another insider tip, the official release date for Box Shapes 2 is tomorrow. So it'll be for sale on my website tomorrow, but it's already on Amazon. You can already go on there buy the book, write a review if you like, which I definitely appreciate because obviously it has none yet. It's just been posted, um, but you can order the print edition. The Kindle is not gonna come out uh, for a little while of Box Shapes 2. I don't know how much demand there will be for a Kindle version since it's such a big book of music. Good question. Uh, Box Shapes 2, so yeah, I was not going to do an etudes book, but I had some ideas of what I could do if I just did a short etudes supplement and basically I wanted to compile all of the etudes from book one and book two, create play-alongs. It gave me an excuse to record a live band and do um, play-alongs. And it also, since it's shorter, I knew it would be easy to do in an E-flat, B-flat concert. And um, what am I missing? Bass clef. Uh, so, you know, it's not a 150 page book. So that's why I did it. And I also included analysis for each etude in here that is not in book two. But to your question, Box Shapes 2 contains and box shapes one and two contain all of the etudes in here besides one, the Irish uh, real one that's on the demo video I've been posting. That is only in this book. So the reason for these is basically to get the analysis, to get the play along tracks, but you can get those with box shapes too, um, and to get uh, different transpositions. So say you have uh, just the regular copy of box shapes two, that's basically written for my instrument uh, in the key of E flat. Most of the time it doesn't matter because they're just scale exercises. So transposition is not a big deal. But for those etudes, they are in the usual standard keys of e flats. For example, Cherokees in G uh, in that book. So if you play alto and you want to play the etudes along with someone on bass, then he could get the bass clef book and you'd be in the same key. And they both work with the play along. So that's why I did the etudes book. I wasn't going to do a, a sort of side book like that, but. It's also a smaller book if people don't want to buy the whole big book. So yeah, it basically contains all of the same etudes, but there have um, there's some extras in the etudes books. Good question. <laughs> uh, and maybe while I'm still on the sort of, before I get into the book itself, on the release schedule side of things, uh, Box Shapes 2 out tomorrow, Box Shapes 2 bass clef 
let's say later in the summer. Next month, um, the Kindle versions of these will be available too. Basically like every three weeks I have a new version of these coming out. And then if anyone saw, yeah, there, right now there are three books total. Um, if anyone noticed that I posted a duet of one of the etudes, so that's another thing I'm working on is writing a counterpoint line to each etude. And I'm gonna sell that as a supplement to the etudes books. Um, so a friend could get, and that'll be an all transposition. So you could have a bass player to play duets with. And I'll also, of course, put it together as one big duet book. Um, anyway, so um, that's what's going on in the world of box shapes, but maybe I'll, I'll, pull, I'll reel it back and focus on to box shapes two. So box shapes two is the main work. Everything I've thought about with Bach in the last few years, and this will probably be my last, I, I say this, I said this last time, but my last Bach themed book, I'd like to write, the next thing I'd like to do would be duets and lines and etudes on standards just without thinking of Bach as sort of a framework. Um, but it's probably indel uh, you know, indelibly in my playing now. It'd be hard to get out, but at least it won't have to be that explicit. So that's what's coming maybe next year. Um, but Bach Shapes 2 is a collection of diatonic shapes, just like the first book had. It's 50 pages of that. Uh, there's, like we talked about, eight or nine etudes, plus some different ones uh, in the book that are not in the etudes books. So there's two or three etudes that are in Bach Shapes 2 that are not in the etudes books because they're not exactly... They're not the same style. They're more continuous practice type etudes. So the more practice -y they are, I didn't want to put them in a collection with play alongs and things because I didn't want to have a play along where you're playing constant eighth notes the entire time. So there's some more technical type etudes in Buck Shapes too. But why don't we open it up before I talk myself out of time here. Let me just share the PDF. So what I'm going to be sharing is the official interior print file uh, that you'll see. I'm not going to share sound. And I've turned already um, to, let's see, page 115. So we're all already well beyond the content of Box Shapes 1. And what this chapter is, is arpeggiation. I didn't get to talk about this very much in the last video. I started at the beginning, like I said, so by the time I got to here, we were kind of just skimming. So I thought I'd go the other way today um, and start here and work backwards a little bit and just talk about what I was going for. Um, and I should say, you know, I put these books together not as a how-to um, initially. It was just sort of a what I think some something I thought would be interesting to practice uh, since a lot of us play Bach uh, as jazz players we practice Bach pieces work on it for our interval playing or tuning and all of that stuff and I was just starting to think it would be cool to take out some of the sequences he uses and just practice them as standalone exercises and that has now branched into this whole applying that to jazz playing which was not necessarily my intention with the first book but because so many people uh, thought of it as that, I took that angle a lot further with this book. So I'm talking a lot more about how to take a basic diatonic pattern relevant to classical players or jazz players and apply it to harmony. So the arpeggiation chapter here uh, is going to, I'll blow, blow this up so you can see it a little better. I know some people's screens can be kind of small when you're already in the zoom window here. Um, there's some introductory material. I start off with the cello suite number four, which you'll probably recognize. I'll just play a little bit of it. So already we have a double octave. Etc. Even though you have this kind of stagnant arpeggiation shape, he mu he moves the voices in such beautiful ways that you have this melody happening. So it starts over this pedal point, kind of over the bottom. I keep coming back to E flat, but he's got all this harmony, which I've analyzed here with chord symbols. And I think I got these chord symbols from my friend Lincoln Goins, who helped uh, working on the 
bass clef version of the first book. These are his chord analyses plus mine, I think. Um, you hear all this harmony floating over that steady E flat in the, in the bottom note, but there's also moving voices in the top. You hear the E flat uh, down on the third line here, descending to D here, descending to D flat. So there's all these what we call compound melodies happening, different lines resolving in different places. And this is so relevant to us as jazz players um, to the point where before I even got into these books, I was doing exercises like this not explicitly taking a shape from Bach, but taking a Bach type pattern and connecting it. And that gave me these exercises. I'm going to skip down a little bit here, um, even past this Cherokee etude. Here is a little thing I wrote a while ago on all of me. So if you just reduce a tune to triads, so forget seventh chords when you go to Berkeley or wherever, uh, it's all about arpeggiating all your seventh chords. But sometimes that's not Sometimes that gives you unnecessary melodic information. There's probably a better way to put that. But start simple with triads, and then you'll see where the sevenths become important, certainly on dominant chords. But I'll just play, here's where we start, just root position triads. <laughs> nothing special there right I'm just playing the roots of the triads and swinging it a little bit but where it starts to get useful is one of course not reading these things so doing this without a piece of music in front of you that's why I only give you a little snippet here because then I want you to go off and do this through twos because that's really the exercise is getting it into your ear um, so the next step is here <laughs> unedited PDF so I'll play what I this is not demonstrating the right notes right now but this is what it should sound like <laughs> things are starting to get interesting because I'm leading into notes. Now I'll do it without even looking at the paper. I'm just thinking arpeggios. I'm not, not playing anything besides chord tones, but I'm trying to connect them in interesting ways. Uh, and then here is where you kind of take that into a Bach type shape. <laughs> start to bring that Bach type voice leading into your playing um, and doing this without again uh, without the music in front of you this is just to get you started is so useful so here I've given in the book uh, a few different kind of example these are from Bach uh, and you'll see them in other places in the book with chord tone analysis uh, different ideas you can try and take through any tune <laughs> That's number three, just from the cello suite that we just heard. That's the one that I'll show you in a second that I use on Cherokee. And then down here, number four. Take it through a tune. So if I take that A minor pattern, say I'm playing, I don't know, softly as a morning sunrise. So I want to take it to the five chord on the second measure. Let's see if I can create that sound. Where I'm kind of all 
altered oops sorry there's some sawing going on out front where i'm kind of alternating um, between the one and the five and i'll show you a spot specifically about that in the book in a second uh, so again if you have any questions so far uh, i don't have the chat up right now uh, but feel free to drop them into the chat uh, i'm going to go on hold on Um, I'm going to go on to the previous chapter. So if we work our way back, since I want to try and cover as much as I can here, I'm going to go back to this is the Cherokee example right here with that pattern I just played. <laughs> And then it goes on starting in different places because it depends on where you start. So I, even though it would have been tempting to go to G uh, in the upper octave here, I dropped it down so we could go different places in the next 16 bars, etc. And then the bridge goes through all these different keys. So this stuff is great to just read as an etude or to work on, like I said, along with a, a harmony player. If you have a friend, I used to kind of sit face to face with a guitar player friend of mine and we would alternate kind of voice leading through tunes like this and it was so helpful. Um, so here's more about that. That's what this chapter is all about. Take some examples from the A minor flute partita, which is what I was just using there to go through Cherokee. And that's the arpeggiation chapter. So that's just a small chapter, but it takes this stuff so far beyond where the first book went. You'll see some quotes uh, interspersed throughout. In Bach, the vital cells of music are united as the world is in God. And then going back. So now this is one of my favorite sections of the book. It does not uh, deal with harmony uh, as explicitly as I was just talking. So there's no analysis here. But having played through so many clarinet method books and different woodwind method books, these are the kinds of exercises I really like for just technical practice and tuning and intervals. So here, these are what I call Bach loops. And that's patterns that I can't necessarily move up and down diatonically, um, but that uh, do have wide intervals. Let me just find one and I'll play them for you and you'll, you'll get the idea. So look at number or let, rehearsal letter A. The reason there's rehearsal letter he, here is that um, I basically go through the whole chromatic scale and then uh, when it repeats and gets back to C, for example, I give it a new rehearsal letter and this, these patterns do that uh, four times. So it's quite a few pages of exercises, but let's look at this letter A. <laughs> up or in this case down up a half step harder so it's a reading exercise too because you're going to run into some tricky accidentals and this one has a real like weird hiccup uh, that Bach does here this is straight out of Bach so there's a bunch of things I can work on as I'm doing this. Uh, let me find one that's more suited to what I wanted to talk about here, uh, which is outlining. And I know I've done a few videos on this. Let's do this one here. Um, number th letter 31 or number 31. <laughs> us back to the top so outlining is when you just play say the downbeats of each beat and just keep looping those important downbeats get it into your body and then fill in the notes uh, and eventually it kind of irons out all of your technical problems with little effort it's kind of amazing because the strength of the musical line takes over in your imagination, you start to hear this line building 
and it kind of tends to smooth out a lot of those technical difficulties you've had. So if you're going note to note to note, you're breaking down that sentence into parts that are just a little too small. Um, so it can get hard to work with. <laughs> And it's not so important that you get it right every time, uh, but it is important to try and stay on the horse. So I played some wrong notes, but I keep that beat going because you want that beat to keep building. So just play it light, repeat it. Another thing I like to do when I'm doing these is sort of work on relaxing my hands. So it, the trick I always have with this, uh, with at least with clarinet where you need to keep a little more air pressure, is it's hard to relax your hand tension while pushing out air with full force. I tend to relax my hands and then my whole body wants to relax. So these have been really good for working on that, pushing out the air while letting my hands relax. You can play it five times and each time relax a little bit more. That's something Andrew Sturman told me a long time ago. <laughs> Now I'm letting my hands go kind of floppy almost and seeing how little muscular effort you really need to play a phrase, which is a really good exercise. So these kinds of looping exercises are great for any of those type of approaches. I even outlined them uh, before the chapter starts here. A little breakdown, play one phrase five to 10 times, relaxing your hands each time. That's okay. <laughs> Thanks, yeah, you'll get the recording later, so uh, don't worry about it. Um, Try different articulations. I didn't even try that just now. Focus on your pitch. Analyze the harmonic material hidden in the lines. So we didn't even talk about that, but that's a whole other thing. And maybe I'll do some more workshops on just this section later, because I really enjoy this section. Outlining, playing some notes with harmonic fingerings. And that, that means, um, so if a phrase is for the G, I might use the low C fingering. But just for one of the notes, I'm not going to try and play harmonics for all of them. I'm going to mix and match. So you're mixing your normal fingerings with harmonic fingerings. So this is great for that too. All right. So that's the Bach loop section as we plow behind, <laughs> plow backwards here. Next, uh, going backwards, is this Paul Desmond solo, which I talked about in another video. So I'm not going to go into that too much right now. Uh, but there's a full Paul Desmond transcription just because it's so Bach-like. There's a, a young player just did a great at-length analysis of Bach uh, and his influence on Paul Desmond that you can see on YouTube. If you want to read more about that, but I've done a little bit here too, and I've written a few articles on that same subject. So the next thing I wanted to look at was this etude on Lady Bird. And this is in the etudes book, and there's analysis there. Um, but the analysis in the etudes book is not in depth. So I wanted to just break down a little bit of what's happening here before I just briefly then show you the rest of the book. So we're not going to spend that much time on each section. Um, and we'll go another 20 minutes or so. And this won't be a very incredibly long workshop. And just uh, while I'm stopped, uh, you will get a discount code in the follow up email. And you'll also get um, what else was it? access to the resource library, which I'm gonna share if I get a chance and show you what's in there. Uh, it's been a lot, a lot of material coming out here. So a Tad Baroque, sorry for all the pun titles, Tad Dameron wrote Lady Bird. So this is a Baroque Lady Bird. This is a hard one to play. It's uh, probably the hardest one for me to play on alto. Um, wide interval leaps, this is the shape from Bach. If we go back, you can see um, the original shape, which was this. That's the pattern. So I wanted to really give myself a challenge because I usually kind of write these etudes a little more freeform than this. But my challenge here was to really just take that one pattern and try and take it through the tune organically. So what you have with this pattern, if I uh, zoom in a little bit here, is uh, this shape. Take away all the interspliced notes, and you have a G sharp, a B, and an E. So it's sort of a E triad in first inversion, 
descending to a D triad in first inversion. And it's just descending triads, and then I just match the chord tones as the harmonies change underneath. And that's what I'm hearing. It's like these constantly descending triads. Then I'm connecting it with the actual phrase. And also kind of displacing the beat, where it starts on beat two, and then on the D minor seven, it's kind of starting on beat one again. So it's moving around, and that makes it interesting too. So I'll play the first few lines. So that's the first half of the tune, um, playing a little briefly to show some of the colors. Uh, in the second line, it's the same pattern. Chromatically go into G minor. Uh, it's really, you know, the, it didn't seem like anything uh, too magical when I wrote it, but now I'm really enjoying going back and seeing how these little phrases that Bach wrote uh, can be kind of really twistingly applied to chord changes to the point where you're kind of disguising the source, right? We want to hide the, uh, hide the secret a little bit <laughs> uh, and kind of trying to disguise our, disguise our influences sometimes. So Bach is hidden in here, but it doesn't necessarily sound like Bach. Um, and one thing that happens on this line here where the cursor is blinking, if you see that, is uh, <laughs> these bebop shapes. Uh, so augmented flat nine sounds C, A flat, F, C. Chromatic approach. And then this is another thing I really like to do. This is called a compound melody again, split voice line. Now it goes by fast and you have to play it all in a row, but it's kind of fun to break it down here, the high voice what in traditional Bach analysis is called the female voice and the uh, lower voice is the male voice. So you're supposed to play the high notes a little softer and the lower notes more uh, strong. Um, you don't need to do that here when you're playing it over time, uh, but I'm trying to borrow from that. And then when we get to the next line, back to the A major, a little bit more modern shape there with a the sharp 11. Same intervals, but now it's all chord tones. And it's a motivic thing. So we have a motive and then it's continuing. Ah. And that last two bars, and then we'll go on, is a, a nice way to take this kind of uh, chord progression that some people tend to play very spelled out. You know, uh, where it can get kind of obvious, and this kind of breaks it down into a nice melodic descending shape. It hits all these great chord tones, but it doesn't sound like much. It just sounds like a diatonic descending pattern. Let someone in here. Um, okay, so there's more etudes like this in the etudes books and also in box shapes too. Actually, at the very end, if we scroll not to take us all the way to the end of the book. Some of the etudes you'll recognize from the etudes book are here too. Sometimes in different keys than they were in the etudes books. So that's the very end of the book. Then we're back to the arpeggiation I just showed you. Cherokee, all the way back to the Bach loops. Just racing to get back to where I was here. The Paul Desmond chapter, which includes that etude because it uh, takes a sort of exercise that I took from analyzing Paul Desmond and moves it into uh, that tune. And then uh, we're into the Circle of Dominance chapter. And this includes this one full page sort of etude that I did not include in the etudes books, again, because it's a little more technical it's not like a melody like most of the ones in the etudes books are, um, but it is fun to play and it does show you a lot of not necessarily Bach ways to get through circle of fifths progressions. So circle of fifths progressions meaning this. That's 
sort of sound that you've often heard imposed on rhythm changes. <laughs> Um, it's basically patterns like that going through the whole circle here. And et cetera, et cetera, and all these different ways of getting through the circle of fifths. So I had a lot of fun writing that and practicing that. And then before that, since we're going today's backwards day, here are some that are actually from box music. A simple one from the A minor flute partita. It's right there in the partita. Here's one from the harpsichord concerto. So he used these a lot as well. Uh, most Baroque composers did. Uh, at some point, maybe I'll do a Vivaldi or a Handel shapes on a uh, circle of fifths progressions because those composers actually probably use them more than Bach even did. Et cetera, et cetera. And here with a little bit of chord tone analysis and explaining about what's happening. And we're going on. I'm just going to do show you a couple more spots here. So. Uh, this is all part of what's the circle of fifths chapter. And this is new to box shapes too, and I've talked about this a lot in the last workshop too, so again, I probably won't spend a ton of time here. But basically what you have is one page each in a different key, and it's all these different shapes right out of Bach, um, and their sources are explained in the beginning of the chapter. Um, along with accompaniment, there's MIDI accompaniment. It's just like keyboard and bass and a metronome. So you can hear the chords moving along as you practice through these. It's not at a fast tempo. And that's something you'll find in the resource library. So here, uh, this is an example. So we're going to have that sort of fly me to the moon progression, if you know what I'm talking about. Sorry, dealing with the alto I haven't played in a few months. So after that, on the play along, after that repeats, it goes on to the next one. And what's nice about it staying in the same key is that you can kind of get into it. And eventually, it, the rhythm doubles. And once you get into the written patterns, break away from it. to play with the progression a little bit. That's how I like to work with these. Any questions so far? Okay. Just drop it in the chat if you have them. Or just ask me to unmute you. <laughs> and I can un unmute you as well. So this goes through all 12 keys. These are the same shapes, but you could even play the whole thing continuously if you're feeling very strong in the chops department. Or if you're playing guitar. <laughs> something less strenuous and that's what we all I'm going to shrink the pages a little bit so I can scroll a little bit quicker so here we're in the middle of the book basically these are the sources you have some from <laughs> yeah exactly in the, yeah in the in the middle uh, it gets into all the hairy keys But yeah, that's why you have options. <laughs> you can see I took a lot from the A minor violin concerto. Some pieces of box are just like circle of fifths all over the place. He just uses those chord progressions. And I'm sure there's many more out there. It's not like I've gone through and listened to every cantata uh, and found everything. But what I was doing the <laughs> and the reason uh, I got into 
oh, this is, I was listening to a ton of Bach and it, you just hear these things crop up. And I did at one point very uh, focusedly go out and um, buy as much Bach music and listen to as many things and scroll through as many scores, circling things as I could find. So that is where most of this comes from. Um, here we are back into section one. So I think we just rewound all the way back to book one. So this could have been two separate books, but again, I felt like when I separated it into two books, uh, something was missing from each one. So I just decided to keep it as one big old book. Um, here, this is the minor chapter. So this is a whole bunch of diminished and minor ideas. This one again from the A minor flute partita, which is so great for solo woodwinds. <laughs> Hard. <laughs> Etc. So tons of intervals. You can make these even harder if you bring in articulations. And you'll notice I didn't put articulations. The bulk of the exercise, I don't put them, but I'm going to show you an exception to that soon. Here we have a Charlie Parker line of all people. So we're bringing in, uh, there's so much Baroque type harmony voice leading in, especially minor keys and bebop players. Uh, so there's a couple lines here from Charlie Parker from Cannonball Adderley. This one you'll probably recognize, it's in one of the etudes. <laughs> That's in the original key for the tune bebop. If you haven't heard that one which is basically just D minor for the whole A section. So when you have a steady D minor like that, it's uh, great to alternate between the one and the seven diminished in various ways. And that can feel like two diminished, like it looks like here. Let me blow that up a little so it's a little bigger. But E diminished is the same as C sharp diminished, right? So I can play around alternating just basically two chords, D minor and C sharp diminished. Once I start bringing in some chromatic approach, it really makes it uh, work. You know, it's hard to just do it with chord tones in a natural way, but he's kind of doing that here. There's also that other famous line that Stan Guest plays all the time. Same idea, I'm really, it's very classical sounding, right? Ooh, my lip is smarting. I played a wedding gig for the first time in uh, a year and a half last night and Danny DeVito was there. <laughs> so that was fun. I was playing uh, Hava Nagila for Danny DeVito. I think he filmed us with his phone, <laughs> but yeah, I'm feeling it. Okay, so going backwards, uh, here's some more ideas with diminished, alternating this time with major keys. Um, this is a great little sequence that I posted in one of my first videos. Play that again. It's a great sound. And I got that from Cannibal Adderley, who uh, is, it's very similar to something Barry Harris talks about, alternating diminished chords and diatonic uh, sixth chords. So really branching out beyond the box stuff at points in this book while always keeping it as a central theme. This is another pattern that just works its own way through 12 keys rather than being presented in one key and then another and then another. It's just one continuous exercise that flows through each different key. Same thing here. Sometimes I move them up and down chromatically. In this case, I have you do it. <laughs> uh, and we talked about this last time too. This is the same. So if I play this pattern up top, which I just posted the other day, that's hard in itself, especially when I was working on it on clarinet the other day. It brings in a whole other element of uh, danger with the fingerings. Um, but on saxophone, it's not as hard, so I might want to increase the difficulty by raising that pedal note, the steady B, up an octave. <laughs> and try not to move my embouchure a ton. So I'd really want to do it really slow and be aware of how I'm moving my jaw. Try not to do subtone that time. <laughs> <laughs> 
it's not as pretty as sound, but it's probably better for my technical interval playing practice. So there's a ton you can work on uh, as far as that goes here. This is all diminished material from Takata and Fugue, from Artie Shaw, whose birthday it was yesterday, I think. A little bit in there from Artie Shaw. Uh, and then we're back to section one. So I'm going to go back to the beginning of this so you can see it from the top. So this is basically part two of the first book, meaning the sequel to this guy is what I'm showing you now. This could is basically another 12 patterns in a similar style from different pieces. I'll show you F major, it starts in C, but let's just start here. Um, and the differences between the first book and this book now, um, <laughs> maybe I will sell it by the chapter, I'll have to think about that. Um, I'll, I can certainly break it down later, but it's more, you know, more cover art. <laughs> um, so here in F major, uh, if you look at this first line, th these aren't as uh, intervallically challenging. <laughs> Now, if I play the uh, slurs, I have articulations written in now. And if I go down, I have different articulations here. But what's key about this book is when I go now to B flat and I see the same patterns, I give you different articulations. So here it's not two groups of two anymore. So every time you see the same pattern presented, it's got a different articulation. I wanted to make use of the repeated ink uh, and give you something different to work on. Not only that, uh, whereas the first book, if you look at it, um, doesn't have articulations at all. It's just notes so you can interpret as you see fit and you can do that with this too but now you have inter uh, you have articulations you can choose to read um, but not only that but i've changed the scale on some so where in the previous key in f this was just f major now here i made it b flat harmonic major meaning i just flatted the sixth <laughs> B flat harmonic major, major is a weird key. So you can get some different sounds going on too. And you are certainly invited to do that with any of these, change the scale. People were doing that with the first book, so I thought I would include some of it here. So you have a whole bunch more patterns to work with here. Some of them are simple, some of them are not. Some of them go only ascend, some of them only descend, but more than the first book I have, most of them ascend and descend. So I had to alter the pattern to make that happen or combine it with another pattern. And in the beginning of this, is it in the beginning? Maybe it's at the end. <laughs> I suppose I should know. There's analysis, no, it's at the beginning. So uh, along with giving you the source of the piece, I've broken down the chord tones, what Bach was maybe thinking, what I'm thinking when I play these, why they're useful playing through a tune. All this is here too, so you have some reading material, whereas again, the first book had very little words, um, but here you have a good amount of reading material. And then we're back to the very beginning and there's only one thing left besides a few quotes and that is the grand scale exercise so sort of a warm-up for the rest of the book and again i gave you articulation at the very beginning and chord symbols but then i got rid of them to keep the page clear <laughs> transposes through all the keys. So that's what kicks off the book after some introductory material. And then we're back to the table of contents. So just to recap, 
and then I'll unshare my screen or actually I'll show you the resource library before we close up. But to recap, there's the introduction, the grand scale exercise, 50 pages of diatonic patterns in various articulations and various um, scales, minor and diminished shapes, that's 20 pages there or 12, um, circle of fifths, all those circle of fifths pages, circle of dominance, the Paul Desmond chapter, the Bach loops, which in itself is 10 pages of great exercises, the arpeggiation chapter that we started with. So if you missed that, go back and watch the video. I'll send it out later. Um, and the leftover etudes, just like the first book, this one ends with four etudes. So again, we're at the four year anniversary of the first book. I never thought I was gonna write more of them, uh, but here we are, this is the third one now. I don't have the uh, print book in hand. So on that note, I'm getting the printed edition in in about a week or so. So if you order it from Amazon, you'll get it right away. If you order it from my site, you'll get the discount, which I think is worth it, uh, but it'll take another week or so for me to mail them out because I don't have them in, in stock yet. Uh, they're print on demand. Uh, so let me unshare this for a second. Hello, hello. And um, let me think if there's something else I wanted to mention. I don't think so. So I'm gonna show you the resource chapter. I mean the resource library. And you can get to this from boxshapes.com. I'm putting a lot more info on boxshapes.com, uh, so stay tuned there. It doesn't have sort of a blog that updates, so if you want minute by minute updates, just sign up for the email list where I do uh, send that out, or my blog on my main site, John De Lucia. Uh, but I'm gonna share this window here, just so you can see what's in the resource library. And there's more to come here. For example, I'm going to start posting full workshops like today's there. Right now, there's just the clips that you see on YouTube. Okay. So here it is. So first of all, you'll see the backing tracks for the Etudes books, the new backing tracks for the new book, all of the articles I've posted for my site and other sites on the topic few for the best. I, I just did this one, how to build bebop vocabulary on that Charlie Parker line basically just a few weeks ago. So that's a new one. The rest are a little older. So those are all in one place. Uh, this is that free, uh, free Willy, uh, Little Willy Leipzig, Little Willy Leaps uh, contrafact that I wrote a couple weeks ago. So it's not in any of the Etudes books. That's going to be in your email too later. So you'll get the downloads for the PDFs of that. And that's a fun one to play along with some other free PDFs, Duet, um, the, one of the duets that's already on my site, but here you don't need to buy it, for, uh, so it's just here. And then the most useful part is every video on YouTube, and I went ahead and posted uh, or re-uploaded a bunch of the videos that I hadn't posted on YouTube. They're all there now, so that when you click through, and they're organized by section. This is book one of Box Shapes 2. Um, you'll see videos on that part of the book. Maybe eventually I'll go in a more organized manner and actually record every page of the books. Uh, but right now, this is sort of a mishmash of all different overlapping sections of the book. But I tried to label them clearly so you can click around and see. And then when we get into book two, these are books on, or videos about the material in book two. Because I've been working on this book for a long time, so there's a lot of videos over the last couple of years that cover the topics. And then these are all the recordings by me and other people. I don't know why the load more is. Yeah, there it is. Um, of all the etudes. So if you need phrasing help on playing the etudes, here's a bunch of different instruments, oboe, clarinet, tenor, alto, alto flute. Uh, I have a singer that's working on one. She's gonna post hers soon. I think Alex Terrier, the alto player, is analyzing that Tad Baroque one on his own page today. So he's gonna have a, maybe a different take on how that analysis went. Um, Yeah, okay, yeah, so I, this is my, this is the most organized I could get since I didn't start out making these videos with the intention of posting it as a library. Yeah, this is as organized as you'll find them is here on this page, that was the whole point. Like I said, if I have an ambitious, maybe if I'm not working on the next book, I can spend the time and go back and really do like a in order breakdown of the whole book. But that's kind of what we did today, for example. So that today's video, when it's posted, will go here in section 
probably book two because we talked mostly about the second half of the book. You'll see it there. So there's tons of stuff here. So if you have the books, this page is really valuable to explain how to use it. All right, so when uh, this is over in about two minutes, uh, you will get an email with the discount code for tomorrow. Yes, book one and book two are all, all box shapes too. Mm -hmm. um, because I, I started doing these videos as I was working on box shapes two. Box shapes one is ancient history at this point. <laughs> I know it's not uh, for the people who just got it, but for me it is. Yep. But of course, but book one of box shapes two is very similar to the first book too. Um, so you'll get an email code, uh, you'll get a discount code, you'll get uh, info on where to get the book. That discount code is good for the rest of the week and that's the plan. So for those watching this recording uh, later tonight or tomorrow, stay tuned for the updates via email and I hope you check out the book. It'll be out tomorrow officially, I can't believe it. Um, PDF on my site print on Amazon and my site. So you can only get the PDF version from me directly and the print you can get from either. And I truly don't mind if you buy it on Amazon. I, uh, you know, it, it's good for the overall sales when people buy it on Amazon and there's reviews and everything. So that helps me uh, either way. So whichever you're more comfortable with. And that's it. If there are no closing questions, I'm going to get to work making sure everything's ready to post tomorrow. Let me stop the share here. Yep. Um, one edition of Etude's book. It's, uh, it's sort of both. So, uh, the etudes books have one etude that's not in the other books, in box shapes one or two. So there is one etude in there that's not in the main books. Um, but there are also a couple etudes in the main books that aren't in the etudes. Uh, is it four editions? Basically, they're all, so if you're, uh, if a bass player is reading out of this book and you're reading out of the B flat tenor book on B flat tenor, you can play with the same backing tracks. So they're gonna look different in each book and there's range adjustments, certainly, but sounding, everyone should be in the same key. If you had four people with the four different books on their appropriate instruments, you'd be playing them all in the same key. Sounding, not talking. Yeah, these are not, yeah, the uh, etudes are not written out in all keys or anything. They're too rangy for that. It's hard enough to transpose them. <laughs> yep. All right, guys. I'm going to wrap it up. But I really appreciate you signing up, and I'll uh, talk to you soon. I'm going to do another one of these in a month or so. Thank you.